Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. Good morning. How's everybody on this foggy morning? Good. Glad everybody. When we started, there were about four people here, so I'm glad everybody wandered in. So, uh, and I wasn't even one of those four. No, I'm just kidding. Um, hey, so it's good to be with you guys. I'm Joel. I'm the teaching guy here. <laughs> Friday night, they gave me this ridiculous award. Um, <laughs> We had this volunteers banquet, and they made this award called called the Pastoring Pastor for Pastors Award or something or other. Anyways, it was insane. Kim made it. So, uh, yeah. Anyways, thanks for that really prestigious award. So, uh, but it is an honor to be with you guys. I really, every Sunday, I don't take it for granted that Pastor Marcus allows me to be with you guys. So thanks for letting me be here. Uh, we're going to continue today talking about Let It Go. But before we do, um, I want to I want to warn you guys about something. I say warn. I don't know what it is. But anyway. So, you know, a lot of y'all know that um, another job that I do is I lead outdoor expeditions around the world, and we, I do hikes to like Mount Kilimanjaro, or we climb, you know, we hike to Machu Picchu down in the South, South America, down to the Andes, we raft the Grand Canyon, and um, one, one trip I do every year is a hike to Machu Picchu, but this year Peru was completely closed. I mean, they literally just opened up a couple weeks ago. They've been closed for nine months. Uh, it's been really hurting the economy there. So this is the first year in many years I haven't been able to hike to Machu Picchu. It's one of my favorite trips. And for years, people have been saying, you should write about what you learned hiking to Machu Picchu. And I'm like, how do you write about hiking? Like, how do you write about hiking? I put one foot in front of the other and then do it again. There's your book. So... Yeah, for four days, right? Yeah. <laughs> so this year, though, I couldn't hike, and I was kind of bummed, right? There's a lot of stuff we haven't been able to do this year. So I'm like, you know what? I'm going to give 2020 to finger, and I'm going to sit down and write. Can I say that as a pastor? I'm not a pastor. I'm a guy, right? So, so I wrote a book that's coming out in a couple of days. Uh, it's coming out this week. And it's a fiction story. I was like, I can write fiction. That's how I do it. It's a little fiction tale. If you've ever read maybe Andy Andrews, where he tells a little story and then gives examples along the way to kind of apply to your life. And um, so it's called Guided by Thunder. And I called it that because when I was 12 years old, the first mountain I ever climbed was a volcano in Guatemala. And we got into this really precarious situation on the volcano. We shouldn't have been climbing it that day. We got caught in a mudslide. And we got rescued by this kind of Nordic guardian angel, a guy from Norway named Torgrim. And he literally carried two of our girls down on his back down the mountain. And so we were able to get out of the storm. So I named the hero in this book after that Nordic guardian angel, Torgrim. Um, it's about a guy who loses a lot of stuff. And uh, Here, I'll read the back. Everett Anderson is frustrated and confused. A global pandemic has ruined his life and shattered his future. Deemed non-essential, he lost his job. His wife filed for divorce, and his financial safety net is dwindling. At the end of his rope, on a whim, he buys a ticket to Peru to fulfill a lifelong dream of seeing Machu Picchu before he starts his life over. The day before his tour begins, he meets a larger-than-life Nordic guide named Torgrim who throws down a challenge. Rather than take the train to Machu Picchu, hike through the Andes Mountains over giant mountain passes instead. Everett has never hiked a day in his life, but something deep inside says he needs to undertake the challenge. So he joins Torgrim and finds himself on an adventure that is more challenging and enlightening than he ever, anything he ever bargained for. So I'm telling you about this because it's going to come out this week. And if you're on my email list and on my Facebook and stuff, I'm going to be promoting a lot. Don't buy it because I'm going to give you guys a copy. Okay. So I was going to say, you can buy one if you want, right? But uh, I wanted to warn you guys, if you all go buy one and then you're like, well, you're going to give me one? What was that all about? So I'm going to give you one. The only challenge we have is the printer is running behind. So I may not get these for about two weeks. I'm going to try and get them to you for for Christmas. Like I put a rush on it, but it may not happen. But here's the other catch. You must be present to win. Okay. So I don't know what Sunday it's going to be. (laughs) 
So you just got to show up for the rest of the year. I don't know when it's going to come in. Anyways, but I wanted to give you guys that heads up uh, that I'm going to give everybody that, that's here that particular Sunday, whenever they come in, uh, I'll give you a copy of this. So anyways, enough of that. That took up five minutes. I didn't need to waste. Okay. Letting it go. So I don't know if you guys know this, but do you know how I met Pastor Marcus? I started dating his middle daughter. Did y'all know that? That's how I met Pastor Marcus. When I was like in my early 20s, I started dating her. And um, where are you going, Emily? <laughs> that was weird timing, huh? Awkward. Oh, okay. Elise needs to go to kids' church. All right. Bye, Elise. We need to pull it together here. All right. So, and I, Marcus and I just totally got along. And it didn't work out with his daughter. She figured out what a, a, a mess I was back then. And I really was a mess back then. But I always had these dreams. I was like, you know, my father-in-law is going to love me. I am quite a catch. So, you know, I didn't date many girls. Uh, I think maybe two before, before I married Emily. But um, I, uh, I, I, my parents lived in Corpus Christi. And I remember one Sunday I went down to see my parents for, to visit them. And I met my dad's new associate pastor. And uh, something about him kind of, at first I was kind of like, what's this guy's angle? Like I couldn't figure him out. And I was a cocky 20 something year old. And I said something really snarky to him. And he did not like it, this associate pastor. He didn't like it, right? Well, anyways, we kind of had this interesting relationship over the months and years. I'd come down and I'd see him and I'd say something kind of sarcastic to him and he'd kind of blow me off, right? And um, then I went on a trip with him one time and I kind of embarrassed him in front of a bunch of people one time. And I thought it was kind of funny. Well, then all of a sudden, one day I, I met this amazing, beautiful girl named Emily. And I was like, wow, this girl is a catch. The only problem was her father was the man that I had been harassing <laughs> all those years. So we started dating and it did not go well because her dad did not like me at all. And I remember when I finally proposed to her, much to his he gave me permission. Okay, granted, he gave me permission. But uh, there was a lot of conflict that had happened. And I remember before I proposed to her, I realized, oh my gosh, I always thought my father-in-law was going to love me. But this guy's like very reluctantly letting me marry his daughter. And I remember thinking, oh my God, it was kind of a, a, a fairy tale dasher to me. You know, you always dreamed, oh, my father-in-law is going to love me. People love me. I'm a great person. And here the guy that I needed to approve of me the most was like, Two thumbs down on that guy. And I had this moment where I just, it was kind of a bummer to me. I'm like, man, this is really a bummer because I thought my father-in-law was going to love me. And uh, my father-in-law did not love me at the time I married Emily. Now, since then, we are like really tight. We've gotten along really well. But I started thinking about all of us in this room. You know, every one of us, we've got something in our mind. And honestly, if we call it, it's an idea about what we want something in the future to look like. We've all kind of got our fairy tale, you know, what it's going to look like when you get that, that, that just the amount you're going to need to retire. And like, once I've got that last dollar in that 401k, I'm out. Peace out on this job. I'm out of here. Some of us got an idea of what our, our future our, our, for our kids would look like. And you're looking around though, and, and your fairy tale has kind of been dashed. You thought your kids were going to like, you know, when they, once my son gets married, his wife's going to love coming over for Christmas. And that ain't happening. You can barely get them to come once every four or five years and uh, you want to see your grandkids more and maybe they're not letting you see the grandkids or we've got an idea about once I make my first, you know, set amount of money, I'll be able to do this or, and we've all got these kind of a fairy tale in our minds. Would you agree with that? And I, nobody wants to call it a fairy tale, especially guys. I don't have a fairy tale, right? I got some visions and goals, whatever you want to call it. We've all got an idea in our future about what we want things to look like. And I started realizing most of the fairy tales we love, the reason we love them is they come down to two specific things. Perfect timing, right? Just in the nick of time, the hero rides in and saves the day. That's the fairy tale. It's just like the perfect timing. Like if he, he doesn't come too early, he doesn't come too late. It's just when it needs to happen, the hero shows up on the white horse and you're like, yeah. And then the other thing we love about fairy tales is perfect appearance. The hero shows up on a white horse not a mangy donkey, right? The hero shows up, the perfect time, the perfect appearance. And I think that's what makes most of our fairy tales. So you're looking at your life and you think about what you want this Christmas to look like or what you wanted this year to look like though. And then you take the reality and you go, this is not working out right. And here's what happens when our fairy tales aren't coming true. 
most of us just get angry. And I'm going to be real honest with you. I'm a psychologist here, so I can tell you this. The other half of us that don't get angry, we're just living in denial. You just suppress it. You push it down. I've been talking to so many people this year, and they say they're not angry, but I watch their actions, and I go, wow, you're really angry. You have a lot of anger, and you need to just acknowledge it. Anger, frustration. This is not what it was supposed to look like. This is not what it was supposed to look like this year. This is not what it was supposed to look like with my kids. This was not what it was supposed to I was supposed to be married right now, and you're not. Or this one. I was supposed to be living in the big city, making the big bucks, and instead I had to move home to Seguin. And here I am. And we've all got these disappointments in life and frustrations. And if you don't acknowledge them, they just turn into pent-up anger and frustration. They come out in weird ways. They turn out with numbing behavior, you know, Find yourself drinking a little bit more than usual this year, smoking a few more cigarettes than usual this year, whatever it is, binge watching TV more, whatever it is to numb the thoughts and the ideas that, man, this really stinks. What I thought it was going to look like isn't what it looks like. And man, and, and God should have delivered me by now. He should have come through by now. Anybody relate to that? You don't have to raise your hand. I know you do. Um, I know you do because I'm talking to people all day long and this is what I'm hearing from them. They're just saying, this year has kind of removed the scaffolding that we had kind of holding up our rickety buildings. And a lot of us are realizing, oh my gosh, my marriage wasn't quite as strong as I thought it was. Or, oh my gosh, am I, I wasn't as quite as important to my employer as I thought I was. Or, oh my gosh, who are these kids that are running around? Like, what is this? And, and we've all had that removed this year. And in many ways, our fairy tales have been dashed. So I want to look at what do you do when your fairy tale has been dashed. When your idea for the future, when the thing you were looking forward to, when you thought you were going to be living strong into your, you know, 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s and maybe 90s, and then you find out you've got a, an illness that's going to be impacting the rest of your life. And everything you had pictured for the future is shot. When your kids didn't turn out the way you thought they would be. And you're going, we're going to be alone for Christmas this year. And I know that my son is out with my, my daughter-in-law at his family. And you're just frustrated. I hear this all the time. This is real life stuff. And we're going to look at a story of, of, of somebody who, well, two people, actually. We've been looking in this series, Let It Go, and, and, and how when Jesus shows up, he asks us to lot, let go of a lot of things we hold dear to, to prepare for him, to make room for him. That joy to the world. Let every heart prepare him room. And a lot of times to prepare him room, you have to let go of what you're holding on to right now in order to embrace what he wants to give you. And I want to talk about two things that we have to let go of today. We have to let go of our timing, what we think the timeline should look like. And we have to be willing to let go of what we think it should look like. Because, trust me, God is doing something redemptive. He is restoring the world right now. But in every moment, of every day, of every hour, of every year of your life, you have to constantly hold things loosely in your hands and be willing to let go of what you have in order to embrace what God wants to give you. That's the battle we have with my little daughter. She loves to hold on to things. And we're always telling her, no, you got to let it go. And she's like, I, can't, I don't want to let it go, sweetie. Dad, I, it's mine. And I'm like, share, share. And she's like, but, but, but. And I'm like, what does letting it go mean? This is our line all the time. What does letting it go mean? Letting it go means we're making room for something better to come along. But a lot of times we don't believe that. Well, if I let go of this, that might be as good as it gets. I can't let go of this. What if it doesn't get any better? And we're in this constant battle of learning to let go and trust God that God really does have greater things for us if we're willing to let go of our preconceived notions, of our timing on how it thinks it, we think it needs to work and on what it, we think it needs to look like. And I think that's what happened with Mary. When Mary shows up, we know the story well. We'll read it, but I want to look at it from this angle of timing. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said, Don't be afraid. This is a little side note. Every time in the Bible someone sees an angel, the angel has to go, Don't be afraid. Angels, angels must be scary things. And yet we have angels of the Lord encamped about us. It's encouraging, huh? Don't be afraid, Mary. You found favor with God. That's another thing that stood out to me. You know, when you find favor with God, he's often going to do something that seems a little bit scary in your life. 
Being a little bit afraid is part of the call that God puts on your life when he asks you to do something big with your life, bigger than you think you can do on your own. Don't be afraid. God's put a call on your life. You found favor with God and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son and you'll call his name Jesus and he will be great and be called the son of the most high and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom, there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, um, okay, how will this be since I am a virgin? Basically, she's saying, so there's a sequence to like <laughs> how this is supposed to go down. And I'm a good Jewish girl, right? So I get betrothed and then I get married. Then we have the kid and uh, the, the, the order's out of line here. And the angel answered, ah, yes, but the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. What I think Mary's basically saying here is, no, 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 no. The timing's wrong. It's too early. It's too early. And here's the thing. A lot of times in your life, there are a lot of you right now sitting here that God's asking you to do something and you're saying, it's a little too early, Lord. I was going to do that after the kids left the house. I was going to do that once the next nest egg was saved up. I was going to do that, you know, once COVID blows over, I'll step out and do that. It's a risky time to be doing that. And a lot of times God will tell you to do something that's you're saying, eh, it's too early. But he's saying, yeah, but my favor is upon you. And when my favor is upon you, you just need to move. So that's what happens here. Too early. Now, now this is what's fascinating about it. Because he goes on, he says, and behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. She thought it was too late. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren for nothing will be impossible with God. Isn't that fascinating? Back to back. Mary, you can clap if you want. Mary says it's too early and Elizabeth thought it was too late. And yet God is saying, forget about your timeline. My timeline is the perfect timeline. And you may think it's too late, but I know when it needs to go down. And you think it's too early, but I know when it needs to go down, so obey. So this is what Mary says. Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. And this, I think, is the word for all of us this year. And John Lennon will be proud. Let it be. That's an old Beatles song for those of you that don't know what I'm talking about. Let it be. So many times we cling to what should have been and we just can't let it go. And we read these stories of grit and perseverance. Oh, that person just pushed through to the bitter end and then they got what they really wanted. It was just on the other side of when they thought to give up. And there's an element of truth to that. But the thing as Christians we've got to do is we don't just push through. We go, God, what do you want for me? If you want me to push through, by all means, I'll push through. But sometimes the greatest act of obedience to God is just give it up. Give up. My dad and I were joking this week. Dad's like, you know, I feel so much better since I've given up all hope. I was like... <laughs> I was like, that's deep, dad. That's deep. <laughs> Sometimes you have to go, God, my hope is, is, is set on, on this happening, but my hope isn't supposed to be set on something happening. My hope is supposed to be set on you. So I'm giving up all hope and what I think should have happened. I don't know what's the deal with my goofy husband. I'm giving up all hope on him changing and I'm turning him over to you. I'm going to follow you and obey. I've given up on trying to make my kid come around. I'm going to love him just the way he is. Deal with it. I'm giving, up, I'm giving up all hope in that. Man, I'm putting my hope in you. So in some ways, you will feel better when you give up all hope in your fairy tale. But, if you, give up, but you don't give up hope in him. And oftentimes, God will, will call you to do something that's a little bit too early or it's a little bit too late. And no matter what it is, you have to say, let it be. Let your timing be. Uh, when, when Elise was first born, my, my wife's a flight attendant. Uh, Emily's a flight attendant. She loves her job. I mean, she just loves it. And um, we decided, we made a conscious effort that for the first five years of Elise's life, before she went to school, Emily was going to cut back on flying. I mean, she used to be flying all the time. She'd be off to Germany and then Guatemala and then Argentina. And, but she cut back on that. And she was only flying just enough to where she could keep the job, not lose the job. And, uh, but we were always looking forward to, man, when Elise starts kindergarten, 
Emily's going to be able to fly a lot more because Elise would be at school and I could take care of Elise. And so we were looking forward to ramping it up. Um, she was going to be able to bring in a little more, bit more money for us. And uh, we, this, was, this was going to be awesome. And, and you know when Elise went to kindergarten? Three months ago. And by that time, Elise had, uh, Emily had been furloughed from her company. So it was, it's been hard. Uh, we, here's something we've been sacrificing for for five years. Like once we can get Elise into school and then around about April or June, we realized that ain't going to happen. She got furloughed. The company said, hey, you can either resign or we'll fire you uh, or take the furlough or we'll fire you. And she was like, well, I'll, I'll take the furlough. So she's not going to be flying for who knows how long. And it's been really hard for us. And we've had to kind of, there's a, a period of grieving for her that she's, I asked her to share this morning. She's like, you just share it. You'll be quicker at it. So, um, <laughs> But it's been a series of, of kind of a period of grieving for her where she just comes back to it. And she's like, oh, that job. It's too, I don't want to give up on that job. And we just have to go back to this. You know what, Lord? Let it be. You knew this was going to be the timing. You know what's going on here. And you know what? If you want me to have that job back, you'll give it to me. And if you don't, I feel so much better since I've given up all hope. I'm just going to move along. I'm not going to hope in that job ever coming back. I'm going to hope in you because you hold my future. And you got to give up on the fairy tale. And that's so discouraging or depressing. Well, it is depressing in some ways, but in other ways, it's kind of liberating because you just say, okay, bring it on. Whatever the Lord has for me. And here's the thing. I can guarantee you this. What the Lord has for you is way bigger than any plans you ever have for yourself. But if you're just holding bitterly to those things that you wanted, he's like, man, St. Augustine said it this way. He said, God is always trying to give us good things, but most of the time our hands are too full to receive them. We're holding on to all this, like, what if this is the best it gets? And God's like, dude, like all the heavens up here, I've got it for you. Just let go of that little stuff you're holding on to. Just let it go. Let go of the timing of how you think it's supposed to work, because I actually know the best timing for you. So Mary's story goes on. Talk about bad timing. Just about the time she's about to have a baby, a decree goes out from Caesar he says, hey, everybody needs to register and you got to go back to your hometown to do this. So the first, this is the first registration when, when Quirinius was governor of Syria and all went to be registered each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house of the lineage of David. And talk about bad timing. While we were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her first son, firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for him in the end. This has both elements of that. First of all, horrible timing. God, why would you allow the governor of our, of our, our region to call for this at this time? That's very bad timing. Not, you women who have been gone through the nine months of pregnancy, you know that ninth month, not a good time to travel. Airlines won't even let you travel during the ninth month. She's on a donkey. I think those uh, airline seats are uncomfortable. <laughs> she has to travel all this May. It's about 100 miles. She has to travel on a donkey. Bad timing. And here's the worst part about it. They get there. They can't even check into a sleazebag motel. They're all booked. So instead, they end up putting the child in a feed trough. And you go, wow, that is not the way this was supposed to look. That is not a Pinterest image. Actually, if you had the right filter, you could make it Pinteresty. But that's not what we thought. It, I guarantee you that's not what she thought it was going to look like. And man, she had already been jolted enough by the word of like, first of all, the timing. Like, this is all out of order. It's all out of order, everything. The timing's wrong. Yes. You know what else is going to be wrong? The appearance, how it's going to look. It's not going to be a fairy tale. But here's the crazy thing about it. Right in the middle of that, God was doing his redeeming work. And I think sometimes, I think sometimes, he has to devastate our ideal and our fairy tale so that we can actually make room for what he wants for us. And that when it happens, we don't think we did it. When redemption comes from the mess and the bad timing and the chaos and it looking really ugly, when redemption comes out of that, you don't take any credit for that. You're like, pfft. Everything was wrong. And Jesus was like, ah, yes. But right in the middle of that, I do my greatest work. If you're willing to let go of what you're holding on to. And, and here's the thing about it. I think you can, you can choose to let it go and make it a little bit easier on yourself. Or God can do it for you, which makes it really 
frustrating and painful and we get resentful at God because we're like, God, why did you strip that from me? And oftentimes he's saying, well, you needed that because I got to give you something better. But you were holding on to it so tight, what you thought it had to look like. And so when Jesus shows up, here's the bottom line. He asks us to let go of our timeline and how it should look. He says, hey, guys, I'm here to save you. I'm here to save the world. I'm here to bring my redemption to the world. But I need you to do something for me to prepare a room in your heart. I need you to let go of all of your attachment to those ideals of what should be. I need to let go of your attachment to how the timing should work. And for some of you, that means that this morning you need to do that thing that it's really the bad time, but you know God's telling you to do it. And you're saying, let's just wait till this pandemic blows over. Or let's just wait until, you know, it's a little bit, we've got a little bit more money in the bank. Or let's just wait until whatever it may be. Some of you is asking that. And some of you are sitting here this morning and you've already given up all hope. You're like, it's never going to happen. Maybe you're like Elizabeth. You're just like, man, I'm old. It's done. I'm just going to sit here and wait it out. And Jesus is saying, nope. I got way more for you. You're still breathing. You're still moving. I got plans for you. And you think it's too late, but it's not. Your greatest work is ahead of you. The thing that God's put you on earth to do is right now. And some of you, you're looking and going, man, this is not at all what it was supposed to look like. You know, my father-in-law was supposed to love me. (laughs) And he doesn't. Your daughter-in-law was supposed to love you. Your son-in-law was supposed to love you and they don't. You go, what do I do? And you can sit around, you can be bitter and angry and grumpy about it. Or you can say, let it be. Let it be, Lord. I trust. My hope isn't in my fairy tale. My hope is in you. And lean on that. You guys receive that? All right. Let me, uh, let me pray for you. Father, I thank you so much that you sent your son to the earth and you did it in such a bizarre way. (laughs) There's so many lessons we can learn from it. Um, But I thank you, Lord, that the mess doesn't intimidate you. I thank you that you're not limited by time. I thank you that one touch of your favor can turn anything in an instant. So I pray for those this morning that are, maybe you're asking them to do something and the timing seems early. It's too early. It's not time, right? God, I'm scared. It's too early to do this. I pray you give them the courage to do it. Pray for those who are kind of feeling despair, feeling like it's too late for them. I pray that you would just infuse them with a sense of confidence that their best days are still ahead. There's still work to be done. It's not time to throw in the towel. And I also pray for Lord, 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 for those who are looking around and going, man, this is not what it was supposed to look like. This is not what I had in my mind. This is not what I was trying to build for our family, for my life, for my career. But Lord, I pray that you would just help us all to go, Well, Lord, just like Mary, let it be. Let it be according to your will, not my way, because we know that your will is what we want. So I pray for everyone this morning. And in this time, Lord, that we prepare room for you in our hearts, I just pray that we just let it go. Just open our hands and say, all right, Lord, take what you need to take to make room for what you want to put in our hands. We receive your grace. And if you're here this morning and you do not have your relationship right with Jesus, um, I would encourage you to make that decision right now. I'm going to say a prayer. And when you say that prayer, if you say it and you mean it with all your heart, Jesus is going to come in. He's going to wash away your sins. He's going to take you from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. Let's just say this prayer together. Lord Jesus, we repent of our sin. We turn from our way. We turn to your way. Help us walk in your truth. Amen. Hey, if you just said that prayer, welcome to the kingdom of God. It's a great time to make this decision. We've got uh, some... Uh, helpful material in the back for you at guest services. If you just made that decision, it will help you on your walk with the Lord. You guys can stand. I pray you guys have a great week. This is the last, uh, it's the last full week before Christmas, isn't it? Yeah. So stay calm. Everyone stay calm. <laughs> Let it be. You guys be blessed. Have a great week. If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.